Welcome to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex, and we've got an interesting show lined up today. And we've got some breaking news. It seems like every time I come in here to substitute for Alex Jones, we've got some breaking drone news. And that's going on right now. We've got a uh, drone, an Air Force drone, that has cl crashed close to a remote Florida highway. It's shut down that highway. We've got a little bit of video here for that. If uh, you guys can pull it up and the people who are watching it can see, it's quite a bit of smoke going on there. Last time I was here, we had an E6B that was flying loops through Austin. There's pictures, if you're watching, of the uh, drone that went down. And uh, it's quite a, bit, quite a bit of smoke, and it was fairly close to a uh, population center. It says, according to an Air Force fact sheet, the QF-4 is tested at nearby Tyndall Air Force Base and at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The plane is a modified F-4 Phantom aircraft. They say it's been used since the 1950s. Now, the last time I was here, Alex called in, was absolutely amazed at the size of this airplane that was flying uh, looping circles around the city of Austin, flying at the level of the buildings, very dangerously low. We eventually learned that it was an E-6B that was doing, as I reported, a training exercise in Austin. And you have to wonder, if they're doing training, why are they doing training so close to population centers? Well, they're doing that all the time, actually. We've got uh, numerous incidents of SWAT teams, not, not SWAT teams, but military uh, exercises in conjunction with our militarized police, with our SWAT teams. They're working together, city after city, doing these drills and uh, arresting citizens who videotape them. We've had uh, reports of that, and we've shown video of, of a citizen getting arrested for exercising uh, his freedom to videotape what's going on in public. And they told him, you have to leave, you're in a dangerous area. And it's like, well, if, you're, if it's a dangerous area, it's because you're landing helicopters here in a public space. And they haven't warned anybody, they didn't cordon it off. And, you know, you have to ask yourself why they're doing it. Well, they've answered that question. We've had uh, videotape of a military officer explaining that you train where you expect to be deployed. So if you expect that you're going to invade a mountainous area or you expect you're going to invade a beach, you train there. If you expect you're going to invade American cities, that's where you train, and you train with the police. And that brings us to an article right now that we've got uh, linked on the Drudge Report. That's on Infowars.com. This is from former President Jimmy Carter. And he said, in the wake of the NSA spying scandal, he said of the American political system, America has no functioning democracy. That's Jimmy Carter. America has no functioning democracy. Now, he joins Paul Craig Roberts, and he joins Senator, retired Senator Gordon Humphrey in criticizing what's going on in America right now. Think about this. This is just one generation removed. These are people who... Have, have retired a few years ago, still alive, criticizing how, how far we have gone into despotism. And another article that's on Infowars.com, we have uh, this from Paul Craig Roberts, and he calls it coup d'etat. He said, Americans are ruled by usurpers who claim that the executive branch is above the law, that the U.S. Constitution is merely a scrap of paper. And he points out an unconstitutional government is an illegitimate government. It says Americans are oppressed by illegitimate government rulings, not by law or by the Constitution, and they, by laws and naked force is how they rule. And he, he doesn't miss any words. He says the South African apartheid regime was more legitimate than the regime in Washington. The apartheid Israeli regime in Palestine is more legitimate. The Taliban, more legitimate. Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, more legitimate. Absolutely true. If you don't follow the Constitution that you swear allegiance to, you become merely dictators. We're going to be talking about that, and we've got some guests coming up that are going to talk about some local solutions to this tyranny coming out of Washington. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Now you can watch Alex Jones live at Infowars.com forward slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. You can also browse the network, the Infowars Nightly News, and over 60 movies and documentaries all together in one place. You can watch the Alex Jones Radio Show live as it happened. So check it out, Infowars.com forward slash show.
Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex. And just before we went to the break, we were talking about just the former generation of leaders in this country talking about how illegitimate our government is. I mean, these are former senators, former presidents. Paul Craig Roberts, who is the um, father of Reaganomics, former head of policy at the Department of Treasury. They're all pointing out that we have basically had the federal government cut itself loose from the chains that bind them down. They've cut themselves loose from the document that they swear allegiance to. Understand that when they take office, the oath to the Constitution is essentially an oath to a superior power, to the law. The law is king, lex rex. What they're doing is swearing allegiance to a king and then ignoring and subverting that king. Now, uh, we've got an article that's linked on Drudge Report from uh, uh, Jimmy Carter where he says, basically, America has no functioning democracy. And as I mentioned just before the break, Paul Craig Roberts said, the American government is an unconstitutional government and an illegitimate government because they no longer pay any attention to the Constitution. Now, also breaking yesterday from The Guardian, there was an email exchange between Ed Snowden and former GOP Senator Gordon Humphrey. And he said, I believe you have done the right thing in exposing what I regard to be a massive violation of the U.S. Constitution. And so when they got this message, um, Glenn Greenwald contacted the former senator just to make sure that it was not a prank, that it was actually there. And what he did was he essentially clarified it and doubled down. This is what he said in the follow-up message. He said, uh, this is a senator former senator writing to Glenn Greenwald. He says, yes, it was I who sent the email message to Ed Snowden, thanking him for exposing astonishing violations of the U.S. Constitution and encouraging him to persevere in the search for asylum. He talked about him being a courageous whistleblower. And he said that uh, no effort, he's very concerned that there is no effort being made to identify and to remove from office and bring to justice officials who have abused power seriously and repeatedly violated the Constitution of the United States and the rights of millions of unsuspecting citizens. And that's the whole point. All you see discussed on the talk show hosts are, how do we keep this from happening again? Andrea Mitchell was uh, interviewing a uh, Democrat from, uh, I think it was Montana, and they were talking about how they could vet security clearances better so this doesn't happen again. Nothing at all about making the government obey the Constitution. Where are we headed with this? Well, actually, James Madison pointed out, and we read this quote last night in the Nightly News, he pointed out a long time ago what was going to happen if we didn't follow the Constitution anymore, and if we didn't understand the traditions that led to the writing of that document. He says, do not separate text, that would be the text of the Constitution, from historical background. If you do, you will have perverted and subverted the Constitution, which can only end in a distorted, bastardized form of illegitimate government. Same words being used by the previous generation of politicians who have and government officials at the federal level. Now, uh, in the second hour, we're going to be talking to uh, Stan Linick. And if you remember, he was the uh, deputy. You might remember this. Uh, when we had the opt-out and film campaign with Ashley Jessica and Jason Burmis, they went to a New York airport. And they were handing out literature, not bothering anybody. And they had the police called on them. And fortunately, the deputy sheriff who showed up was Stan Linick. There's a little video of that. We're going to be talking to him. He stood up for their constitutional rights. He refused to bully them because this fellow with the airport and, and the fellow who was trying to, uh, to get the police to bully them should have known better. He was formerly somebody who worked in the media. Now, that's uh, Stan Linick that we're going to be talking to. And he was uh, Deputy Sheriff of the Year by the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. So we're going to talk to him because, you know, we need to have people who have legitimate authority. People who have legitimate authority are people who put themselves under the Constitution, like Deputy Lennox did. So we want to talk to him, and in the third hour, we're going to be talking to Kirsten Tynan, and she's with the Fully Informed Jury Association, because that is where you come in. That's where every one of you can come in, because you can stand in the gap against bad laws, against oppressive government. You can stand in the gap and make sure that your fellow citizen gets justice and that unjust laws are not enforced, and that's a very important thing. Most people don't understand 
where that power comes from. They don't understand the tradition of that. They don't understand the uh, judges will basically tell juries lies. They will suppress information about what the rights and the duties of the jury truly are. But let's think about where this is really headed. Let's look at somebody who actually lived under the Stasi. There was an amazing article that was translated into English, and uh, I tried to get this guy to uh, come on so we could interview him, but unfortunately he doesn't speak English. This is a pastor who lived under the Stasi in East Germany, and he has something that all Americans should really think about. He talked about living there for, uh, for most of his life up until about 20 years ago when it fell. He says, we all recall the fall of 1989 when thousands of people all over German Democratic Republic marched from churches to streets and squares. Now, this fellow was a pastor. And one of the things that he had done, and he was surprised to find that the Stasi didn't know anything about it. He actually had smuggled in from the West a miniature lab, and he was doing testing of the water because he knew they were putting chemicals into it. <laughs> Not uh, openly, like our government puts fluoride and other things <laughs> that we know are harmful, uh, things that are banned in Europe. Uh, they were putting other chemicals in as, as well as that into the uh, water, and he was doing testing and, and giving information out about that. Uh, and they didn't know about that, but they pretty much knew about everything else. And one of the things to remember is that it was the clergy uh, who were instrumental in getting people their freedom in East Germany, just like they were very instrumental in giving people their freedom here in America. They called them the Black Regiment during the Revolutionary War. And what happened in East Germany was that the pastors organized people in the churches, and the churches marched in mass to the wall, to the spots where they would shoot people if they got too close. And the soldiers finally refused to fire. And it was that kind of a peaceful stand down in mass that, assen that essentially brought down the fall of the Stasi and the East German government. But I want you to think about what it's like to live under the Stasi. And this is what he tells us. He said, uh, how did a state keep this population of 17 million in check for 40 years? The answer, through surveillance, incarceration, and terror. The wheels of terror were implanted in every brain. The moment a critical thought took shape, the wheels of terror started turning. Who would be able to hear this and make note of it? Which file would it land in? What could be the consequences? What reprisals would be taken? Could there be an impact on the children's schooling, on their apprenticeship position, or their college placement? Even preschoolers and kindergartners had internalized that. And he said the guarantor for terror and order was the Stasi, state security. They called it in German, eavesdrop and peak. Now that's what our government is doing to us today. And I find it so disturbing that Americans can come out and say, I don't care. They can look. I don't have anything to hide. Well, the people in East Germany didn't have anything to hide either. But nothing was able to be hidden. And listen to what happens when you know you're being watched. Hardly anything went undetected. Like a fungus, surveillance permeated all of social life in the, quote, service of socialism to protect the country from the imperialistic class enemy. See, they had a different enemy. It's always necessary to have an enemy. Our enemy, of course, is now Al-Qaeda. Used to be the communists when that was no longer a credible threat. Now they're holding up these boogeymen in caves. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. But uh, he says, during demonstrations, and this is how pervasive the threat of the Stasi was, that even when they started to have demonstrations that led up to the fall of the government in 1989, he said a huge crowd of people marched through downtown Eisenach in the state of Thuringia, where I live, chanting. But the moment the train of protesters passed the headquarters of the Stasi, they fell silent. Nobody shouted anything. So here you got a crowd of people who are in defiance of this communist regime and demonstrating, but they are afraid of the Stasi because the Stasi knows everything about them, records everything about them, uses that to control their lives, to control their futures. That's what total information awareness is about. It's a, a means of control. It's a means, and that's what surveillance leads to. People need to understand this. He says, listen to this, the Stasi not only surveyed the everyday life of citizens, but also influenced our lives. In my case, the Stasi sought to document my underground political activities with the goal of gathering enough material to take me to court. But they didn't wish to wait until I'd made a mistake worthy of prosecution. Instead, they used snitches to plant rumors in my parish and to strip me 
of the backing of my superiors in the church. They even tried to set up an informer on my wife to destroy our marriage. Snitches provoked me, engaged me in topical conversations, intercepted letters, intercepted personal contacts, indirectly influencing and manipulating my life. And he goes on to say that whenever they would have a meeting, whenever the church would get together, any function, they always knew that there were Stasi members, Stasi informers that were present. Then he said they would even cynically extend a welcome to those who, quote, had to be here professionally, unquote. So they knew, and he said he never said anything at a meeting that he wasn't willing to to go to jail for. Is that the way you want to live? Because what we're going to see in America is something far more pervasive, something far more dangerous than anything that ever happened with the Stasi. You can see pictures of rooms full of files, paper files on people. They had no way to data mine most of that. They, connect, they collected so much information on people that they really couldn't put it all together. But we now have this massive data center that's being built in Utah that is going to use uh, enough water. Just the, it's, it's so massive, so incredibly massive, so much data storage, so much heat being generated that they're going to use enough water that they could supply thousands of homes. And that's a big issue out in Utah. But it, that's where we're headed. We're headed for a complete and total surveillance state. We're headed for something that is far worse than the Stasi ever did, something that is far worse than George Orwell ever imagined in 1984. And the American public just shrugs, many of them. Those of us who are aware have to wake up the others to the dangers that are coming. And we're going to be talking more about that in just a few minutes. Stay tuned. The important thing about the Pro One filter today is that the material we use for removing fluoride and other heavy metals now we'll remove the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. There's no other fluoride reduction filter out there that will remove that type of fluoride. And it's extremely important because today we're hearing more and more cities are using that form of fluoride. We've been having medication forced on us through the water system for quite a while. Most people don't realize it. Most people don't realize the negative effects of fluoride. There's a wide range of health effects that are attributed to fluoride. Bottom line, why should somebody get this new Pro One Pro Pure filter? The reason to buy the Pro One, it's an all-in-one filter. It's convenient, easy to use. It doesn't require the add-on fluoride filter. And in addition, this filter removes the latest form of fluoride called hydrofluorosilicic acid. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight filling in for Alex today. And we were just talking before the break about uh, the Stasi, life under the Stasi. And a lot of information is coming out about that right now. People are very sensitive about that, especially in Germany, because it's come out that uh, we were conducting massive spying on Germany as well. And uh, they don't like to be spied on because they have this tradition of the Gestapo and the Stasi. And uh, as one person wrote in the Financial Times, her name was Constance uh, Stellensmuller. She wrote, uh, our grandparents' generation feared the early morning knock on the door of the Gestapo. Well, you know what? At least the Gestapo knocked. Uh, that's not the case with the American Gestapo, the SWAT teams, right? <laughs> I guess we should call them the SWAT teams because it sounds a bit more German. Um, they just bust the door down. They throw in grenades, flash stun grenades, and they shoot anybody who doesn't understand that they're the police. Uh, you know, if somebody kicks in your door in the middle of the night, your first reaction is going to be to take defensive action, to grab a gun or something. They kill people over and over again for that. Uh, but that's become standard operating procedure now. Uh, she said that um, it was only after the fall of the uh, wall in 1989 that people really understood how much terror was being perpetrated on them. You know, people in America still don't understand that. And one of the things she mentioned about this was that um, in Germany, she said, we have a better reason to fear uh, the secret state than most people. She said, they don't like closed circuit television cameras. We're perfectly comfortable with them in America because we don't understand how they're being used. It's also why our constitutional court enshrined a fundamental right of data privacy and declared it illegal for Germany to implement an EU directive on preventative data storage. You know, if you remember that uh, comedy video, Alex talked to the uh, fellow who um, 
who did it, I don't recall his name right now, but he, he was following people, he was a comedian, he was following people around in public places. He had a big boom mic, and he uh, had some uh, fake uh, earbuds on. Tom Mabe, thank you. And uh, he had some fake uh, uh, ear, ear mugs on, and he's dressed with sunglasses and a suit like a CIA agent. And he puts this microphone in people's faces, and they're like, hey, get out of here. Uh, when you understand the surveillance, it's very abhorrent. And it was abhorrent to the people in Germany because they understood it was being done by people. When it's completely automated, when it is completely uh, transparent, you don't notice the surveillance, you don't notice the cameras, people don't object to it. And that's the very dangerous situation. Even things like free speech, and we, this is an article on uh, InfoWars. Paul says 34% of Americans say the First Amendment is too extreme. That's right. We don't need our First Amendment freedom. I mean, why would you not want to have freedom of speech? I mean, that's the most amazing thing to me. I mean, that's not anything that, uh, uh, why, why could you, how could you make a case against freedom of speech? I mean, this is, people have been totally brainwashed by the state, by the state media, the state-controlled mainstream media, to think that they have to give up everything for their freedom. But you know, the opposite of liberty is not security, it's slavery. And liberty and security go together. You can't have one without the other. As Thomas Jefferson said about uh, life and liberty, he said the hand of force can destroy them, but cannot disjoin them. That's the same thing with liberty and security. You know, you can have a government that destroys both your liberty and your security, but you can't have one without the other. Now, the interesting thing about this, this is a survey that was conducted by the museum. That's a news museum. And uh, they do an annual survey about people's attitude toward the First Amendment. And what they found was that it was up from 13% who really didn't think that, the, uh, the, that we should have free press or free speech. It went, jumped from 13% to 34%. So more than a third of the people don't think we should have a free press or free speech or freedom of religion. And it extends to other things as well. As we've said all along about this fight for the Second Amendment. If people don't respect the Second Amendment, they're not going to respect any of the other freedoms either. The government, if they don't respect that, they're not going to respect the others. And interestingly enough... Only 4% of the people uh, valued the Second Amendment. So they don't really understand their, their freedoms. You know, they don't understand what they're about to lose. Now, we've got this contest that we're going through feverishly trying to uh, come up with a finalist and look at all these different um, films and give them a fair viewing, multiple viewings. One of the ones that I, I saw just recently was a film called Dream, A Dream Revered. And you can see these films at infowars.com forward slash Paul Revere. Or just forward slash P, I think, takes you there as well. Now, in this particular film, it, it, what got me about it was that it starts with the person's uh, personal recollection about how his jobs have gone. They've left this country. They've gone to other countries. He worked in Detroit. And he's driving through Detroit and saying, this is your future, America. And uh, we're going to be talking about that right after we come back. He talks about how the, the jobs have gone. He talks about the great sucking sound that Ross Perot warned us about. And he talks about what's being put in its place. And we'll talk about that right after we return. Stay tuned. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at infowars.com slash show. 